Warm, a warm welcome for Dr. Nunley. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. So for Pastor Jeff, that which has been lost has now been found. And for Pastor Weaver, that which was lost is still lost. Yeah. So you get the best of both biblical worlds going on there. Do I have to, um, Pastor Weaver, do I have to stand behind the platform tonight or? No. We don't have to see you. Okay, good. Because I like right here better. How are you all this evening? Okay, first of all, thank you all for coming. And again, now I'm going to do what Moses did in reverse. He parted. I want to bring together, you know, like for folks that are sitting on the edges that won't be able to see. You probably noted that is you're not able to see as well on the edges this morning. That will be equally the case tonight. A lot of focus on biblical imagery tonight. Um, and seeing is believing, and a picture is worth a thousand words or maybe more. Uh, and so if you find yourself in a spot where you're not able to see as well, you are totally not rooted. Feel free to get up in the middle of the discussion, presentation, whatever this is, and, and, and move to a point where you, where you can see better. So let's kick off. Tonight, our subject is the top archaeological discoveries of the last year. Now, the reason why I've done this is because it's been right about a year since the last trip that I did, study trip that I instructed for uh, New Hope Assembly. We go back now going five years uh, when I met Pastor Weaver and um, uh, Pastor Austin uh, in the first trip that we did together, which was a student trip. And then there have been a couple of New Hope trips, and we're coming up on our third one almost a year from date. So this is just going to fill in the blanks, mostly since you guys were, were there last. Kind of bring you up to speed so that when we hit the ground running in February with the third New Hope uh, trip, we are really going to be kicking like chickens. Okay? So top archaeological discoveries of really of the last year, last uh, fiscal year, if you want to call it. Next slide. The first thing is we picked up, we're picking up where Sunday school left off. You remember our subject this morning in Sunday school? Jesus' three light of the world sayings. He says, um, I am the light of the world, and he also says, you are the light of the world. So this is the shoulder of Susita. If you keep on going up, you come to the top of the hill here. Uh, this is the Sea of Galilee back behind. We're actually looking from the, the eastern side, the Golan Heights side, back toward the west and Israel proper. So all this area over here, that's Israel proper, and we're on the east side. So there was a temple that was discovered to the Greek god Pan, uh, Pan. Uh, and this is where we get our English words, panic and pandemonium because the god Pan was sort of the Greek god Pan in Greek mythology uh, was the prototype of that Pied Piper of Hamelin that would lead the children out playing the flute out into the uh, forest and the children would never be seen again. He's a scary kind of dangerous, not so good god. I'm not sure exactly why anybody would want to worship a god like this, but then I'm not a Greco-Roman, right? So thank goodness for that. Thank, thank, thankfully, there are not any Greco-Romans among us tonight uh, because we're taking Pan's name in vain. But this is a large temple complex, and there was actually found a mask to the Greek god Pan, you know, that they would wear in um, uh, uh, certain kinds of festivities and the like connected to his worship here in this temple. This is one of those buildings that on top would be, um, would be built of, uh, of imported white marble and then the sun going down in the west that way, shining back this way, would reflect off of those facades of temples and banks and civic buildings and theaters and that kind of thing and would give the, um, uh, would tell the residents around the, the, the lake that uh, this is the end of the day um, and it's just about for time for the Sabbath to be over. You may remember that at the end of the Sabbath, if you read Matthew and Mark and Luke, 
that they brought to Jesus all of those who were sick, those who were possessed of demons. It says at sundown. Why would that be? If they're sick or possessed, why wait until after the sun goes down? Because that was the end of the Sabbath. You have to remember that Jewish time reckoning is from um, evening to evening, from sundown to sundown. So right now, at sundown, we're already into, according to Jewish reckoning of time, we're already into Monday. You're late for work and didn't even know it. Um, uh, but uh, this, is the, this is the Sea of Galilee back behind, and that's that place, Susita, or Hippus. And uh, all of this stuff, again, is going to be on your website, and you're welcome to, to download that, including the imagery. Next slide. Um, this takes us back into our mode of Sunday school, just to remind you, Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world, city sent on a hill cannot be hidden. I think that I've been able to isolate that via some rabbinic literature and the geography to Susita. Uh, next, also John 8, uh, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. You remember that part of our Sunday school. If you missed it, again, uh, it's kind of like the rapture. If you missed the rapture, you'll get it on instant replay. Just saying. Yeah. I'm not saying you're going to. I'm just saying if you do. John 8, John 9. Next, John sa says in chapter 9, while I'm the world, I'm the light of the world. So you have these light of the world sayings, and I think that those are connected to a number of things which we synced up in Sunday school. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because we already did that, and it's going to be on, it's on the uh, website or will be uh, the entire presentation from the Sunday school class. So I'm going to kind of short shrift this so we can spend more time on the other stuff, the new stuff. Is that okay with y'all? Okay, next. Uh, and this is, that's going to be on, that's another part of the slide. It's, it's, it's the bibliography, three articles that I've written on this light of the world stuff. You can either get it at PE News, there's a, it's a two-part thing, part one and part two, penews.org, or you can wait a few weeks and the whole thing is going to be, it's going to be a joined, a big long joined article with lots more pictures at the uh, website of the Center for Holy Land Studies. So you just type in holylandstudies.org, but they're migrating their website from one platform to another. We've been caught in, this weekend in the middle of that migration, and it's kind of like the birds coming back. It's not quite spring, but we know that it's on the way because that's what the weatherman says or whatever. And we know we believe those guys, right, because they always tell the truth. Um, so it's coming, but it's not there yet. So if you want the full meal deal with all of the imagery, it's this one down at the bottom, or just type into your uh, Google search, holylandstudies.org, and go to the articles section. Next. All right, here's the next one. Now we're cutting new ground. That one we did, that, that Sunday school stuff. This one, the Temple of Augustus and Roma in Caesarea. We, were, we knew that it was there. We weren't 100% sure where it was, uh, but, but we knew it was there because Josephus describes it. Josephus is a, how do we, what do we know about Josephus? Why is he important? We learned this this morning. So this is, he's a Jewish historian from what century? The first century. And what do I mean by first century? Human, human chronology is divided up into chunks of 100 years, right? They're called centuries. This is the first one, first century. Okay, you got that. Um, the time of Jesus, first century time of Jesus. Somebody told me that not everybody was on board with that. It's kind of like the Dead Sea Squirrels. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure we touched that base. All right, this is the uh, harbor area of Caesarea. Here's the harbor area right here. Here's uh, Herod's palace. All of you guys who were in Israel with us before you remember this. Between Herod's palace and the port area is the Hippodrome, and that's this area right here. We walked it from this end to that end. Also, we walked through the Crusader period wall uh, into this area that is the port. That's the port right there. This green area is grass, and it's just all silted up. That's why it's not water there. You remember this. Come on, Marv. Help me here. Right? All right? And so up on the bluff above, this is where the temple to Augustus, Augustus Caesar. He is, he is a, a living Roman emperor, and he is being worshipped by people like Herod the Great as divine, as a god. 
because of his status in the empire. He's the top dog in the empire. And then the goddess Roma, well, that's the patron goddess of the whole Roman empire. So they're sharing a temple up there on the bluff above the harbor so that when sailors came in from off of the Mediterranean, they could dock their ship, they could offload their produce, and they could go in and they could offer their worship to Augustus Caesar as a living divine being and then also the goddess Roma, and they could, uh, I guess, sleep well at night that night or whatever. Make sure that Mrs. Sailor back home is staying faithful while they're out on the ship for months at a time. All right, so we knew that this was there. Josephus tells us it was there, but now we actually have not only the, the temple itself, but uh, take a look at the next slide. In this area, we have the temple, but we also have the base of the altar that has an inscription on it to uh, the worship of Augustus Caesar. All of this you can find on the internet if you're interested. Just go to Images 4. Next slide. Josephus tells us this. On a hilltop across uh, from the entrance to the harbor was Caesar's temple. That's any time that you hear just Caesar, it's Augustus Caesar, you know. And Augustus Caesar gave a decree that all of the world should be taxed. This is New Testament world right here, yes? So Augustus Caesar, Caesar's temple, prominent in its size and beauty, it contained a gigantic statue of Augustus, no less magnificent than the statue of Zeus in Olympia. This is Herod the Great's building here. He's building a temple in the land of Israel to a seated Roman emperor that has been elevated to the status of God of deity, all right? So, or on which it was modeled. There was also a statue of Roma, equal in beauty to the statue of Hera and Argos. Now, this is a supposed to be Jewish king who's ruling over Jewish subjects in the land of Israel where it's, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, right? Or chapter 8, the, the Deuteronomy chapter 8, the, uh, that God says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. You shall make no graven image, that kind of thing. And just some 60 years after this, this land erupted in what is called the first Jewish revolt against Rome, which we know to have concluded with the destruction of Jerusalem, the decimation of the temple, the exile of Jews and selling of Jews into slavery, the killing of 3,000 Jewish martyrs in that hippodrome uh, in gladiatorial combat and that kind of thing. Unbelievable destruction wreaked on that country, but it was because they kept being pushed and kept being egged and kept being um, uh, moved in the direction of revolt because of these kinds of things. It was really difficult to get east and west together in this respect. So the beginnings of the revolt, the seeds of the revolt, they're being sown right here in um, Caesarea on the sea. Next slide. Okay, apologize for the caption there, but the, the, the reality of the reality is that that's the reality. Um, there's a place in Timna. Tradition had said that this was a place where King David and King Solomon had mined copper uh, for the uh, production of weapons because copper and tin could then be melded into bronze and bronze was stronger than copper by itself and if you had the ability to do this kind of metallurgy then you could hopscotch over your enemy and have better weapons. You know, we're still in a weapons race today, right? That probably won't end until the Prince of Peace ends it, yeah? But until then, we're dealing with arms races. David and Solomon are in a life and death struggle with a group of people called the, starts with a P, the Philistines, exactly. And the Philistines had military, had technological superiority over the Israelites because they were even, they'd hopscotched all the way into the Iron Age. And the Israelites are still throwing rocks and sticks at people. This is the reason. It's not because of no, numerical superiority. It's because of technological superiority. But Israel had a stealth weapon. You may remember. You remember the name of that stealth weapon? Starts with a G, ends with a D. 
Yeah, the God of Israel, exactly. He is the divine table leveler. And so the Israelites end up being the survivors of antiquity, of ancient history, and the Philistines are gone. There aren't any anymore. That's interesting, isn't it? They had incredible technological superiority, but the God of the, of the people of Israel, not the Israelites, but the God of the people of Israel is that divine equalizer. And I love that. I, I love it when the weak defeat the mighty. I think God likes a, a, an underdog too, right? I believe God even rooted for Rocky. <laughs> anyway, I'm hoping so. Th there's, this area here is uh, on the way to Elot, and we're going to be going to Elot on our next trip. And then we're going to cross over into Jordan, go to Petra, right? So you, at Elot, you'll be able to dip your foot in the Red Sea. Um, and uh, this is on the way to that, Timnah. More than likely, we'll arrange, a, if not a stop, at least a drive-through. Because this is one of the most important mining operations of antiquity. The Egyptians controlled it. At this point, according to the tradition, the Israelites were controlling it. Even the Bible says that Solomon and David had operations going all the way down to Elat. But the modern uh, 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 biblical scholars tell us that, um, no, th that's all fiction. That's pious fiction. That's people in Babylonian captivity wanting to create for themselves a glorious heritage of the past since the current situation, they're in Babylonian exile and things aren't going so well for them. So they're wanting to be able to tell their children really rousing, encouraging bedtime stories. So they come up with these ideas of a united kingdom, of a, peop of, of a group of people like Dave, Saul, David, and Solomon. And that's really where those stories came from. They really had, it, it had no basis in reality. But recently, uh, researchers from Tel Aviv University, here's a real quick um, uh, top pop quiz. What city is Tel Aviv University located in? <laughs> Another A. Everybody gets an A. All right. So they uh, were able to excavate um, uh, donkey droppings, and they did really, really top-notch, cutting-edge research on this donkey poop, and they were able to determine that the, uh, the, the donkey poop contained fodder that, uh, from uh, plants that are only grown around the area of Jerusalem. So the people then that are doing this mining operation are people who are united enough centralized enough, organized enough to export donkey fodder to this place and then to feed that to those donkeys. And then they did another piece of the research puzzle, and that was because this stuff is biodegradable, right? Then if anything that's biodegradable, you're, you're able to date by means of carbon-14. And guess where it dated to? The exact time of the, de the days of David and Solomon. So you've got a united, centralized government that is strong enough to exert its influ uh, um, exert its influence all the way down to near the Red Sea. And this is telling us that all of those narratives in the Bible about David and Solomon, about how they came up with this gigantic um, uh, enlarged kingdom and were able to subdue the people groups, the Philistines, the Edomites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, etc., cetera, um, around them and to exact tribute from them, all of that stuff has come to be corroborated by donkey poop. Isn't that great? It is, I mean... Isn't, isn't that historical irony at its best? Let me take you one step further, because I love historical irony. The people who discovered this, University of Tel Aviv, they're the ones, they're the primary perpetrators of this, of this idea that David and Solomon were make-believe, that they're kind of like King Arthur figures. They're sort of like Robin Hood. They're their, their myth, their legend, they weren't reality. And now they're having to eat their own crow. All right, now I know where you're going with that. Now they're having to eat crow. And, and I like that. I appreciate that. The Israel Finkelsteins of the world, these guys who have said, 
there, okay, there, there's, there's Bible and then there's reality. No, there's Bible and reality, and they're one and the same. They're not two different realities. So praise God now even for Tel Aviv University. I never thought I'd say that. But because of Timna, my Sunday school class has a new saying. They say, Timna happens. <laughs> just, it's just in the interest of open disclosure. I, Next slide. Sorry, Pastor Jeff. <laughs> okay, this is a, this is an, a drone shot of um, a site that was opened up a couple of digging seasons ago. Uh, we're coming up on our third digging season now. First one was a sounding. Last year was the first true full-blown digging season. This is our third or second, depending on how you count. Uh, it's, it's, a, um, it, it's an archaeological area uh, in the land of Israel. It's just north of the Sea of Galilee. I should, have a, uh, I should have a satellite shot, but don't. Just think Sea of Galilee, North Shore, a little bit east of Capernaum, for those of you who have been there. And the Arabic name is Tel El Araj, but we're thinking that this is biblical Bethsaida. It's really important because about a half of Jesus' disciples came from there about a half of them. We know that uh, Peter and Andrew uh, originally came from there. We know that Nathaniel and Philip came from there. Uh, we know that Jesus was there. Uh, we know that he healed a blind man there. We know that it had a synagogue there. Um, and uh, so there has been a site called Bethsaida that's been under excavation for th somewhere around 30 years. Um, the problem is they haven't found any New Testament remains there to speak of. A coin here, a fish hook there. It's probably somebody camping out. There's no, there's no significant um, buildings and that sort of thing. Um, no re real remains from uh, the New Testament period. And Bethsaida was a New Testament site because Jesus was there. There was a community there. He ministered there. Miracles were worked there. Jesus refers to, the New Testament refers to it on a couple of different oca occasions. So this place is about a mile and a half off of the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and yet it's called Bethsaida. Bethsaida means the place of the fishermen. A mile and a half inland, really? When there weren't any mechanized vehicles and that kind of thing, no trams, no trains, no cars, no trucks, no way to get your catch from the seashore out of your boat and onto a truck, a mile and a half inland and then have it processed and then bring it back for shipment to other places on the, on the sea. It's just probably not really happening. This spot, though, um, last year it was discovered that there are first century remains, first century coins, um, significant buildings, um, even one that is probably a, a church marking the spot from the 300s AD, you know, just a couple of hundred years after the days of the apostles. So it's thought then by the researchers, by the excavators here, that this is probably the biblical Bethsaida. You guys may know this name, Tel El Araj, Bethsaida, not just from the, from the Bible, but also because this church um, uh, donated to those first couple of seasons. So you have actually made an, a, a financial investment, boots on the ground, money in the plate, whatever, it, whatever happened, to the excavation at Tel El Araj. And what that means is that there is a financial investment and spiritual connection between this congregation and what you're seeing from a drone shot overhead. Um, more to come. Next time that I'm here, when we're in the land of Israel studying together, there will be updates on this. I look forward to that, don't you? Next slide. Oh, by the way, I, mentioned, I didn't mention, but it was up in the caption. This was number three on Christianity Today's um, top ten most, or top seven, or whatever, most important archaeological discoveries of 2017. That's pretty cool. And you guys were in on the ground level, pun intended, um, of this particular excavation. I, that's bragging rights right there. Amen. All right, next slide. Uh, a capital. It sits on top of a um, pillar. It spreads the weight out, okay? So you have a thin capital, a uh, thin pillar, but then you have a capital that sits on top of it. This one happens to have come from the temple of Herod the Great, which means that this capital was probably walked under by people like Peter, Andrew, James, John, Jesus, Paul, 
okay? It doesn't get a whole lot closer than that. This is a first century B.C. capital from the area of the Temple Mount. Can I get another slide? Uh, um, Jesus is um, celebrating this particular, uh, and when he's in Jerusalem, he's in the portico of Solomon. Uh, that's one of those colonnaded areas with these Herodian capitals on it. And, and uh, this is where part of the ministry of Jesus took place. Take a look at these two passages in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 3, as well as in Acts chapter 5, you have the um, followers of Jesus who are duplicating or imitating his ministry. As Jesus was in the portico of Solomon, teaching and healing, so they are also. I think it's pretty neat that you've got followers of Jesus, first generation followers of Jesus who want to do it the way he did it. Now, pretty soon, Christianity outgrew the Temple Mount, outgrew Jerusalem, even outgrew J Judea and the land of Israel, and had to go to the Greco-Roman world so that people like you and me, people not born of Jewish parents, could come into this, what God was doing, expanding his kingdom. I'm thankful th to God for that. I, I appreciate that de developmental stage, but I also appreciate this initial developmental stage where these people had a heart to do ministry like they saw the master doing ministry. I like that. And I want the church to buy into that, today's 21st century church, to buy into that model. I want to watch it. I want to see what Jesus does. I want to see how Jesus does it. And then I want to do ministry like he did it. I want to, I want to be a witness. I want to be a light to the world. I want to do it like he did it. I appreciate that, that attitude and heart. And so we see that. These guys are in these, this colonnaded area running around the, the edges of the Temple Mount in the same way that Jesus was doing ministry and teaching, um, preaching, uh, healing in the um, portico of Solomon. Next, uh, this is a, just a picture of the Temple Mount. Um, that's not Marv. I, I did enough damage already this morning, Marv, Marv and, and, and you can put that on my tab. My apologies, kind of, sort of. All right, so here's the city model. We typically visit that on trips to Israel because it's a great teaching tool. And this is the Temple Mount right here. So the big uh, court, that's the court of the Gentiles. And running around this kind of sandbox is a what we call a retaining wall. It was enabled Herod to expand, Herod the Great, to expand the Temple Mount um, and uh, to create what we call the court of the Gentiles. Running around it on the top is a colonnaded area, and you can see the columns there. That's the way this capital functioned, as one of the tops, the heads of those pillars. And this is the area of Solomon's colonnade, or Solomon's porch, or Solomon's portico right here. Next. A Roman theater in Jerusalem. Again, our friend Josephus, the first century Jewish historian from the land of Israel who also wrote in the same Greek that the New Testament is written in. Josephus told us some 2,000 years ago, yep, there's a theater, a Greco-Roman style theater near the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. People looked all over the place for it, couldn't find it. The conclusion was either A, Josephus was wrong, He's just kind of making stuff up as he goes along. Or B, the, 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 the Jews hated the Romans so bad that whenever the Romans finally left after destroying the temple and the city of Jerusalem, people carted off those stones that were already worked to build their own houses and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, what happened, though, was a surprise to everybody friend of ours, some of you guys know him by name and face, Eli Shukron, has been digging underground following sewer systems and, and storm drain systems. And uh, one of those eventually led to uh, the discovery of this very small theater. What we thought, and the reason why it was overlooked, and it was partly is because it was underground, okay, and nobody had excavated that part, uh, but the other thing is we were looking for a gigantic Greco-Roman theater, the ones like you would find at Caesarea or at Beit Shan that would be as big as this, as this uh, auditorium, this sanctuary. Um, but this is one that will only uh, seat about 200 people. Just in terms of size, you can see this guy right here, right, down in the pit. Uh, so that's the size of an average man. 
and uh, this would only seat 180, 200 people max. And so we were looking for a huge theater and we were underwhelmed. It's okay. Now we know that Josephus was right, as he usually is, and we also have access to this uh, Greco-Roman theater. My hope is that they have this open for us to be able to um, uh, observe when we're in the land next. Next um, slide, please. All right, that is going to be, we're looking at now at, at the city of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. We were looking here down on the Temple Mount a minute ago. Now we're looking from the south up the city of David. This is all there was, about a 10-acre plot that, uh, that David um, uh, conquered and then refortified. The um, area we're talking about here that Josephus is describing the place of the theater is right in that area right there, but underground. Next. Um, re recent discoveries in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, the Greek Orthodox name for this same building is the Church of the Resurrection, which I like a little bit better. The reality of it is, you've heard of the 14 stations of the cross. The last five of them are located inside of this church, including the, the place of Jesus' crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection. Um, so a very significant site and one that we uh, regularly visit when we are in the land of Israel. Next slide. Um, this is the city of Jerusalem. The little red uh, circle here, that's the church of the Holy Sepulchre. We were just a moment ago in this area right here looking underground at that Roman uh, theater. Earlier, we were up on the Mount of Olives looking down on the Temple Mount to talk about the, the porticos, the colonnade, the big uh, capital on top of the pillar, and, and Solomon's portico, which is right over on that quadrant of the, of the you can see, still see the box. It's not exactly a rectangle. It's it's actually called a trapezoid, but it's close to a rectangle. Here's the um, Dome of the Rock here in the middle. This is the um, Mount of Olives. The Judean wilderness is back here in the background. And if we were able to get just a little bit stronger projection, you could see a little thin blue sliver right across here, which is the Dead Sea. You can see that from, from this aerial shot. So. Mount of Olives, Judean Wilderness, Dead Sea back there, just use your imagination. Uh, the Kidron Valley, the Temple Mount, this is the old city of Jerusalem and the wall going around it. And right here is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. In Jesus' day, the wall ran from here and cut in and around the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and then joined the Temple Mount right about here. Uh, so that is outside the city in Jesus' day. This is a Turkish period, 1535 A.D. wall, and so that is the, quote, modern, yeah, 500 years old. That's the modern wall of the city of Jerusalem. It's from the time of the Ottoman Turks. So this is the area we're looking at, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Next slide. Here's another one from outdoors. Uh, you can always tell anywhere you are because of the t one, two gray domes. Is the roof of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And in the background, that's the, that's the top, the ridge of the Mount of Olives. Continues on along like this and finally dives off into the Kidron Valley. Next. All right, this is the front door to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Yes, there is a back door. Uh, so this is the front door. You can see that this is Crusader architecture. It goes back to the 1200s AD. The Crusaders rebuilt the Church of the Holy Sepulchre during the time of the Crusades. Um, this is a little plaza where we usually stage up and do a little teaching here before we go into the left side. <clears throat> the right, right side has been bricked up forever and is not accessible. So you go in here and we typically exit here as well. Next slide. All right. These are um, images that I pulled off of National Geographic website uh, just for your viewing pleasure. Uh, this is an artist reconstruction of what this area looked like before it was ever a church. It was a quarry. You can see where stone has been quarried out. That's what the archaeologists and the geologists tell us. Indeed, that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is built over what used to be a quarry. Um, 
uh, once it was no longer usable as a quarry, in other words, the good hard limestone had already been quarried away, it was abandoned, it became a place of, do you see the crosses right here? A place of execution and also a place of garden and then also a place of burial. And that's typically the way it is. There are example after example in the land of Israel where a quarry then becomes a garden which also becomes a cemetery. Um, it's just kind of a natural progression and a reuse of land that's pretty, it makes sense when you think about it. Um, so here's the burial site, here's the uh, site of execution. All around there's a, an abandoned quarry with an adjacent garden. Uh, very neat layout there. Next slide. Um, that, this is a close-up of what the tomb looked like. The tomb would have been chiseled. We're told that in the Gospels, that it was a recently hewn, H-E-W-N. It means chiseled by human activity. Tomb that uh, included a burial bench. And then uh, initially, this doesn't show it right here, but it should have. First century tombs had little niches running out like that, that after the body decayed over a year, then the bones were collected. They were placed in what is called an ossuary, a little bone box, as long as a, as, as a, as a human femur, and then pushed into one of those little niches, okay? They're called kukim tombs, and this one doesn't show that all that well. There are six of those inside the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and one of those is the uh, burial chamber of Jesus. You see the body uh, laid out like this. Here's the rolling stone right here. And um, the interesting thing that they discovered in recent um, uh, renovations was that uh, they removed the Crusader period marble slabs and actually were able to expose for the first time since the Crusades, ladies and gentlemen, since the 1200s AD, we're talking back, back in the days of Richard Lionheart, yeah? That they were able to expose the bedrock that was chiseled out by whoever Joseph of Arimathea hired to do, actually do the hands-on work, the um, preparation, the burial preparation bench on which Jesus was laid. This is the one where the angels were sitting on one side and on the other. Peter and John looked in. Mary was looking in from outside, saw the angels. These stories are in the, at the end of your Gospels. And um, we now have demonstration that what we thought all along was a burial tomb was indeed a burial tomb. It was also first century. It was discovered that there was some mortar in here that went back to, did you know about this new process that you can date mortar? because most mortar has some kind of organic material in it. I think this is a, a refinement of carbon-14, but they're actually able to date mortar, and they dated the mortar to A.D. 346, which is exactly the time that the Emperor Constantine, the first Christianized Roman emperor, commissioned his mother, Queen Helena, to go to the land of Israel and to mark with octagonally shaped churches places that had an unbroken tradition going back to a major event in the life of Jesus. Isn't that fascinating? Okay, so we have the actual burial bench. Go figure. Next slide. This is a, what is called an edicule or a cenotaph. It's a sort of a monument uh, of sorts built over the original tomb of Jesus to protect it from people who would want to chip off pieces to take home as a relic or as a souvenir. And that was going on in ancient times. And that's the reason why so much of the original tomb of Jesus has been quarried away. But the original burial bench, the bench of preparation, is still there as discovered uh, during the recent renovations. Next slide. Okay, and there's what it looks, looked like uh, when it was first built. And here's the burial bench. Next. All right, here's some of that original um, uh, mortar that was datable by uh, this new process. You can see here the hand of the, of the workman. Next. In John chapter 20, Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she beheld angels in white sitting one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. 
This is really interesting. This morning, we saw, as an example, we saw a pulpit that Jesus read the scriptures from and preached from in the um, uh, synagogue at Magdala. You may remember that. Uh, we saw other stuff. Jesus' reference in Sunday school. Jesus' reference to um, the city that's set on a hill that cannot be hidden. What we're actually doing is every year that goes by, we're getting more material culture in our possession that takes us steps closer to the original, real, historical Jesus. And I like that. I like that. I like it. It clarifies Scripture. I like it that it challenges people who are of no faith to have faith. It challenges people to have faith, to persist in their faith, and deepen in their faith and let their roots grow down deep into the realities of history, language, literature, culture, archaeology, geography, geology, meteorology, and all of these wonderful sciences that we have at our disposal now, and all of them that we use when we study on-site in the land of the Bible, cha-ching. You know you love it, give it up. All right, uh, next slide, please. Recently discovered boule, and that doesn't mean what you think it means, okay? It's a technical term, it's Latin, and it means clay seal impressions. Thank you very much, Mr. Timna. Next slide. <laughs> Here is the southern wall of the Temple Mount, and this is the eastern wall, this is the western wall, and this area is the western wall that where the place of prayer. Here's the uh, Dome of the Rock. Um, here's the Mosque of Al-Aqsa. Uh, this is the Temple Mount, okay? So we're just on the slope going down the hill into the city of David. It looks like this, okay? We're going down the hill into the city of David. But right before you get, do you guys remember that we're with us in Israel before? Do you remember this street that kind of cuts the Temple Mount off Solomon's addition to the city of David from the city of David proper? Do you remember this? We drive up this road all the time. We always get off right about here. See those buses right there? Okay. Or further up the hill so we can go into the Dung Gate. Sorry for the reference to Timna again, but it's, that's the real name of the gate. It tells you its function. It's how you got the stuff out of the city. All right, so this area here under excavation by uh, current archaeologist Elat Mazar, granddaughter of the great Benjamin Mazar, you may know that name from Biblical Archaeology Review or stuff you've seen on TV. Anyway, she's excavating in this area, and let's see what uh, Elat Mazar has found. Um, a year or so ago, she came up with this particular bula, a seal impression. When you see on television uh, stories that um, kings or governors or generals or something that in the Middle Ages they're writing things out by hand and then they roll up the scroll and then they let, let, they let candle wax drip onto the edge of the paper and to seal it shut they put their royal seal impression on that. Okay, in biblical times they did not have candle wax. They weren't making candles. If you've got translations of the Bible that talk about candles or something like that, that, that's not reality. In biblical times, it was oil lamps with olive oil inside because it's combustible. It will burn. It will give light. It will give heat. All right? And so that's, they're not dripping wax onto documents and sealing them shut with a seal impression. Instead, because they didn't have wax yet, they're using clay these are the clay seal impressions of royal, of official documents from the, you know, the, the upper crust, from the people who are in charge, the, the high muckety mucks, the people in, in charge of the temple, the people in charge of the treasury, the people in charge of the royal house and that kind of thing. This is a really interesting one because it says, um, it says, um, belonging to Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, the king of Judah. Anybody know Hezekiah? Second Kings, Second Chronicles, Book of Isaiah, Hezekiah, right? He's a, he's a best friend. He's a, you know, like close associate 
with people like Isaiah the prophet, Micah the prophet, okay? We now have his name and his title and even his dad's name and his title on a seal impression from the 7th century B.C. Can you count backward 2,700 years? I mean, in the United States, we think of something civil war. Oh, man, that's ancient. Revolutionary war. My goodness, that's really ancient. It's all relative, isn't it? Because those things are a couple of hundred years ago. This is 2,700 years ago, almost three millennia. We're dialing back into the days of the divided kingdom period. King Hezekiah, Isaiah the prophet, um, a voice crying in the wilderness. You shall call his name Emmanuel. That Isaiah, right? All right. So note also this unk right here. That's an Egyptian uh, symbol. And also, this is the sun, and it has wings. So this is also an Egyptian symbol. Something going on between Isaiah, his father Ahaz, this business of being the king of Judah, and some connection to Egypt. That's an Egyptian symbol. That's an Egyptian symbol. So let's take a look at some Bible passages. Biblical realities corroborated, confirmed, or testified to by evidence outside the Bible, like Hezekiah's seal impression. Good evidence, right? 2,700-year-old evidence. It's not something Wave Nunley in his wild imaginations because he had too much pepperoni pizza the night before. This is archaeological reality. So there was a kingdom called Judah. Remember Hezekiah? the son of, uh, of Ahaz, king of Judah. Okay, so there was a kingdom called Judah. It, it was when the northern tribes broke off from the dynasty of David. At the death of Solomon, Rehoboam took the southern kingdom of Judah, and uh, his capital was Jerusalem. And it says in uh, 2 Kings 12, Now when Rehoboam, son of Solomon, had come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin to fight against the house of Israel. That's the northern kingdom. But you know, in reality, we didn't need the book of 2 Kings. We didn't even need the Bible to tell us this. Next slide. This uh, couple of three pieces, one, two, three pieces of an Aramaic um, victory monument, from the 9th century B.C., we're talking about 3,000 years ago, was written by an Aramean king named Hazael who had invaded the northern kingdom of Israel, done battle with kings of the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel, and defeated them in battle and set up this victory monument as a memorial to his awesomeness. Okay, so here's what it says in translation. Well, let me give you just real quick, go to the next slide. Okay, here's uh, whited in this um, B-Y-T. The Hebrew is Beit, like Bethlehem. It means place of or house of. It also means dynasty of. And then the next word is D-V-D, and that's not a prophecy of a modern technology. That's the consonantal spelling of the name David. All we've got to do is supply the vowels. So the dynasty of David, and the right above that, which you can't see, it says the word Israel. So the house of David, that's in the south, that's the kingdom of Judah, and then Israel, the kingdom that is the northern kingdom. Let's take a look at a text. Uh, this is it in its uh, artist rendition. Next text. It says, this is the translation of that Aramean, Aramaic victory monument. I, Hazael, killed 70 kings who had harnessed uh, thousands of chariots and thousands of cavalry, and I killed Joram, the son of Ahab, the king of Israel, and I killed Ahaziah, the son of Joram, the king of the house of David, or the southern kingdom, that was loyal to the Davidic dynasty. There you have it in stone, literally written in stone. Israel, Judah, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Again, not make-believe, not some kind of national history that was cooked up by priests in the Babylonian exile. No, this far supersedes this victory monument. It goes back to the 9th century B.C. The exile of the people of Israel didn't happen until the 6th century B.C. You do the math on that? It's only off 300 years. 
Nobody made that stuff up. We have the, we have the historical corroboration written in stone. Praise God. Yeah. Next. There was all, no, point number two. There was also a king of Judah whose name was Ahaz. We're told that, uh, that um, in the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, became king. So Bible and stone or clay, if you will. That seal impression of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, the king of Judah. Next. Third corroboration. Ahaz did have a son whose name was Hezekiah. And he uh, succeeded Ahaz on the throne of the southern kingdom, ruled this time. Ahaz slept with his fathers and was buried with his father, was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His son Hezekiah reigned in his place, and now it came about in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, the king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah. It's letter for letter, word for word, the official title of Hezekiah that we find on the seal impression. We find it in 2 Kings right here in chapter 18, right in front of God and everybody. Isn't that awesome? You got to love this when it comes together. Next, Hezekiah is fourth uh, proof or uh, reality that is corroborated. He was closely associated with Egypt because he was hoping that the Egyptians would help form an alliance with him to push the Assyrian threat back to the Euphrates where they belonged. Notice that the, these passages in 2 Kings 18, which is word for word the same as Isaiah 36. Don't rely on that crushed reed, that, that, that broken reed. It'll pierce the hand of anybody who leans against it. So is Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to all who rely on him. This is what Isaiah was saying to his buddy, Hezekiah. He was not a rubber stamp man. He was not a, he was not a rubber stamp um, uh, um, figure in Hezekiah's court. He was pushing back against Hezekiah. Trust God, not Pharaoh. That's still a good word for us today, by the way. Next. Um, that's just probably good enough. You'll have this on the internet. Next slide. Uh, now we have another discovery of another bula, B-U-L-L-A, or seal impression on clay. This one is a partial one. You see, you see that it's broken off, but it says le, belonging to Yeshayahu Navi N-B-Y. Now, I want you to do a little study with me for just a moment. Yeshayahu is Isaiah. It's Isaiah in the Hebrew language. Let's take a look at this N-B-Y word. Next slide. Yeshayahu, the prophet. Isaiah, the prophet. N-B-Y, and then there's one letter missing. The A on the end, which is silent anyway. It's kind of like silent E. If you dropped it, would you still know what the word meant? Yes, envelope with an E, without the E. Is it tomato that has the E on the end or is it potato? I know, you don't know, I don't know either. But that's my point. That's exactly my point. Silent E, silent Aleph. Next, next slide, please. Hezekiah, the son of, uh, of Ahaz, king of Judah, and Isaiah, the seal impressions, were found about 10 feet apart from one another in a garbage dump. So all this stuff had been swept up and thrown out the window or taken out by a servant and dumped outside the palace. Isaiah and Hezekiah are mentioned together 14 out of the 29 times that the word Isaiah shows up in the Bible. Isaiah appears in 2 Kings as the closest advisor to Hezekiah. No surprise that their bula should be found 10 feet apart from one another in the same archaeological level or stratum. Here's another point. Uh, there are only six other biblical figures named Isaiah in the Bible. It means Yahweh's salvation. There's a Levitical singer in the days of David and Solomon, wrong archaeological stratum or level. Um, there is a, um, a Levitical treasurer who was a great-grandson of Moses. Again, wrong time period. There was a great-grandson of Zerubbabel way too late in time. This is after the Babylonian exile and in the days of the return. There are two, two returnees in the days of Ezra, 
uh, and Nehemiah, and they're named Isaiah, but they're way too late as well. The only Isaiah that this fits is Isaiah the prophet, the friend of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, the son of Ahaz. It's just a really interesting biblical corroboration of a whole bunch of realities. And by the way, yeah, if you wanted to look up in a Hebrew dictionary, the words that start with the letters N-B-Y, there are no other ones except for the word prophet. So it's got to be Isaiah the prophet. So you have biblical, you have biblical corroboration, you have archaeological historical corroboration of Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, the king of Judah, and you have his most uh, uh, trusted court prophet and advisor, Isaiah, who is called Yeshayahu Hanavi, Isaiah the prophet. It just doesn't get any better than this, guys. You got to cherish this in a Napoleon, no, not Napoleon Dynamite, a Billy Madison kind of way. All right, next. Last point, and then you get to go home or ask questions. Your call. A hoard of coins was found uh, recently, uh, again, by Elat Mazar. A lot of d digging going on around the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. These were found in a cistern that had become a part of a um, storm drain system, and people were hiding from the Romans in the year A.D. 70 down underground, trying to keep from being put to death as the Romans were breaching the walls of Jerusalem. Jerusalem and the Temple Mount were about to fall. These are the closing days of the revolt, the first revolt against Rome, 66 to 70 A.D. All of these coins come from the time period of the revolt itself. Most of them come from the first couple of years uh, of the revolt, and they are stamped with this impression, for the freedom of Zion. For the, Zion's a nickname for Jerusalem, right? For the freedom of Jerusalem. But in the last year, it seems to have, the, the, the mentality seems to have taken a darker turn. Instead of for the freedom of Jerusalem, they are stamped for the redemption of Jerusalem, the, rege the redemption of Zion. In other words, they're looking for God to intervene and to do something that they have not been able to do themselves, and that is defeat the Romans, keep the Romans at bay. Take a look at the uh, translations of these coins. For the, the freedom of Zion or for the redemption of Zion. Again, Zion is a code word for Jerusalem. Take a look at Luke chapter 2, verse 38. Jesus is in the temple. He is being dedicated to God at age 40 days. There's a prophet whose name is Simeon who comes in and prophesies. There's a woman whose name is Anna, and she is identified as a prophet. Yes, there are female prophets in the Bible, thank you very much, and, and a bunch of them, not one or two, uh, and in the New Testament, not just in the Old Testament. Um, and she comes in, and she says, she comes up and began giving thanks to God and continued speaking of him to all those who are looking for, what is it? The redemption of Jerusalem, for the redemption of Jerusalem. Isn't that fascinating? So again, you've got this in the Gospel of Luke, in the early days of the life of Jesus, you've got a prophetess who are, who are, who's coming, sending out the message of one of the first evangelists, telling the story of Jesus at now age 40 days, and she's telling this to people who are looking forward to God's divine intervention to redeem the city of Jerusalem, and we have that in those coins. The only difference is this, is those people initially were looking to themselves to bring freedom from the Romans, to bring freedom for religious expression, worship God the way that they wanted to. But what Anna, the prophetess, is saying is this comes through God. It can't come through human means. It can't come through just simply taking up the sword and killing enough Romans to get their foot off of your neck. This kind of redemption only comes through an act of God. And indeed, that's exactly what God was doing when he sent his son, Jesus, to bring redemption, not just to Jerusalem, but to me and to my house, to you and to your house. And that's the kind of God that we serve. Praise his name. God bless you, New Hope. It's been good being with you, even though this was a short trip. 